be able to stand before you once again and uh, talk about uh, God's Word and study it together, sing songs together. We appreciate Blake and the others who have led singing uh, over the course of these uh, last several weeks. We are continuing our Every Book in a Word study. Uh, some have asked, they've reached out to me on, on, online and in various methods and have asked, um, you know, are you going to continue this study once we uh, get back together? And certainly uh, we will do that, Lord willing. Uh, as well, it's our plan to continue to uh, uh, broadcast these, to stream these services online and to record them and uh, upload them to YouTube. So if uh, you're interested in following this series along and you are not uh, a regular member at the Morrison Church of Christ, you can certainly continue to follow along as we uh, move through these sermons over the next several months. We're going to continue. If you've been following along, you should know that we are now in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, and I did struggle some with trying to discover, or trying to, to boil it down to one word, because to me the most obvious word was the word king. But that's almost too obvious. In fact, the book of Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, is often referred to as the first book of the kings. Uh, and then, of course, we have 1 and 2 Kings as well. And so uh, it might become confusing. But, but in reality, the word that we really do need to focus on is the word king. You see, the nation of Israel had a king. Long before it was the case that they had an earthly king, the nation of Israel had a king. God was their king. And the first part of the book of 1 Samuel relates to the period, the latter part of the period, in which God was their king. But then the nation of Israel desired to raise up self as king. And the middle portion of the book of 1 Samuel relates to that. But then the latter part of 1 Samuel is devoted to the extended transition that takes place during which time Saul is the king in person. But David is the king by God's direction and the prospective king eventually. And so God as king, self as king, and David as king, those will be our guiding points for this evening. Uh, we start first with God as king. You see, the nation of Israel did not need an earthly king because they had a king. Everything that the nation of Israel needed in a, in a leader was embodied by God. If you can think back to the things we've already noticed throughout the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, one of the central ideas has been that God was to be the center point of their life. Do you remember back in the book of Numbers when God arranged the tribes of Israel, how He arranged them in order all surrounding God as the center? That tabernacle was to be in the midst of the congregation. God was to be their center focus. And then who was to guide them through the wilderness but God in a pillar of fire and in a cloud. God was to be their guide. God was to be their protector. God was to be their central focus. God was their king. Even in such uh, destitute times as are mentioned in the book of Judges, it was recognized that God was to be the king of Israel. Gideon was wildly successful as judge and had placed upon him uh, an undue amount of respect, much like what we noticed this morning. But Gideon forbade the people from placing him as king over them. In verse 23 of Judges chapter 8, Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. You see, there's a reason why these leaders that are raised up are called judges and not kings. Their, their job was to lead a deliverance. Their job was to, to make judgments among the people. Their job was not to be the king 
the prince, the president, the ruler. See, Israel already had that. And they had that in God. We recognize then that God was to be the king of Israel. By this time, the nation of Israel had, had come under the judgeship of a very capable man. And the first portion of the book of First Samuel is devoted to Samuel's rise as prophet, priest, and judge in Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20, Samuel is described there as a prophet. You'll remember that, uh, that he was provided to his mother Hannah. And you'll remember that as a result of that, she dedicated him to the temple, turned him over to Eli once he had been weaned. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 3, God spoke to Samuel about the future of Eli and his house, how they would not continue in the priestly office. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20, it said, All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Samuel was prophet. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1, he is priest. Notice it says that the word of Samuel came to all Israel. He continues to say as you move through the context in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 9, notice the extent to which he was in charge. Verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and he offered it. Why? Because he was the priest. He offered on behalf of the people, on behalf of the nation of Israel. So Samuel is not only prophet, he is priest. Not only is he prophet and priest, but he is judge. You look at 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the years of his life. Notice the extent of his judgment in verse 16. And he went from year to year in uh, circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all of those places and his return was to Ramah for there was his house. So Samuel spent his entire adult life uh, uh, holding the office of prophet, priest, and judge, but not king. But under Samuel's leadership and guidance, the nation of Israel was finally beginning to look like what God desired them to be. Samuel established the schools of the prophets. Uh, he established uh, prophetic offices and, and those prophets were sent out to guide and to direct the people in the Word of God. Samuel was devoted to God and to His Word. And the nation of Israel much more greatly resembled what God desired them to be during the judgeship of Samuel than they had during the period of the judges and the book that bears that name. So Israel didn't need an earthly king. They had a judge very capable, a prophet, a priest very capable, and God was their king. Well, there's a very obvious point in that for you and for me. God should be our only king. Yes, we have presidents. We have kings and rulers in our world. And no matter what country a person resides in, there is someone exercising headship and rulership over them. And that's fine. God allows for that, and for that there are no conflicts within God's Word. But God is to be our only king. Romans 13 and verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there are no powers but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God's in charge. No matter who the president is, no matter who the king is, no matter who the ruler is, no matter what nation we find ourselves in subjection to, God should be our king. We have employers on this earth. Nearly every one of us is subject to someone at work. But God is truly our boss. 
You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul runs through the, the gamut of relationships that human beings have upon this earth. He talks about husbands and wives in Ephesians 5. He talks about parents and children in the first part of Ephesians 6. And then in verse 5, he says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Dear friends, no matter who we are employed by, no matter where our citizenship is on this earth, God is our king, God is our boss, God is in charge. And it ought to be He who rules in the primary place in our lives. When we read through the book of 1 Samuel, that ought to be one of the primary messages that boils to the forefront of our understanding. God is to occupy supreme place in our lives. But for the nation of Israel, it was not that way for long. Israel demanded a king like all of the nations. You can turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and there you see this horrific transition. Again, at the end of chapter 7, it says in verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life and that serves as a transition to chapter 8. Verse 1 says, It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the first was Joel. In the name of the second, Abiah, they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, took bribes, and perverted judgment. And so here in verse 4 begins Israel's complaint. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And they said unto him, Behold, behold thou art old. Thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Contained there in verse number 5 are two reasons, one outward, one inward, why the nation of Israel chose to appoint for themselves an earthly king. Number one, your sons are old and they don't walk in your ways. That, that's the excuse. Have you ever known people who they want to do something and maybe the reason they want to do it is, is just simply because they want to do it, but they seek to, to try to find a good reason. And that reason isn't really the reason, but they want it to be the reason. They want it to seem to be the reason when in reality it's just an excuse. You see, that was the case for the nation of Israel. They said, oh, your sons are old and they're not walking in the ways of God. Therefore, we want a king. You see, there were other solutions to that problem than a king. That was just the outward reason. What was the real reason, the inward reason? They said, make us a king to what? To judge us like all the nations. The reality of the matter was Israel wanted to be like everybody else. They despised the fact that while all of these other nations round about them had kings that they could point to as their earthly rulers, it was not the case for Israel. And they said, we are tired of not being like everyone else. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to be like everyone else. But if we do some closer examination, there's even a more deep-seated problem. You see, because in reality, it wasn't just the case that they were replacing Samuel or that they were replacing even Samuel's sons. Continue reading in verse 6. 1 Samuel 8, 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now why did it displease Samuel? The context is probably going to bear out for us that Samuel took it personally. Look, they don't approve of my sons. They don't approve of me any longer. And so they're seeking to replace me. But notice what God says in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. In all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee. But you see, here's the real problem. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. He says the real issue isn't about Samuel. It's not about Samuel's sons. 
In reality, the real problem is with me. The nation of Israel no longer desires to be guided by their God. They want to be guided by themselves. You know, it's telling, and we didn't really focus on this too much when we studied through the book of Judges, but, but at least twice in the latter chapters, that illustrative uh, portion of the book of Judges, at least twice it says, at that time there was no king in Israel, but everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And now they want a king in Israel so that they can do that which is right in their own eyes. What's so impressive about this from God's standpoint is that God had foreseen all of this. He says in Deuteronomy 17, 14, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt possess it. This is in Deuteronomy 17. And thou shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. God says, I know what's going to happen. You're going to get settled into the nation of uh, into the land of Canaan, and you're going to look at all of these nations around you, and you're going to say, I want a king just like everyone else. You know, we desire much the same thing today, don't we? How strong the pull is to be like the world around us. You know, we talk to young people all the time about peer pressure and about the dangers of giving in to the desire to be like those around us. But it's not just young people who deal with that. In fact, it's not even individuals who deal with that. Nations, communities, individuals all over the world and groups of people all over the world struggle with that same problem. Mankind desires to set himself up as king and to feel good about wanting to be like everyone else. You could go to Romans chapter 10 and you can see the problem there that existed with the nation of Israel. And, and Paul in the book of Romans talks to two main groups. Number one, he talks to Israelites. He talks to Jews by uh, nationality. But then also he talks to Gentiles. And notice what he has to say to Jews. One of the things he has to say to Jews in Romans 10 and verse 1, Brethren, he's talking to Jews. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about, listen to this, to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Notice God describes a people who have been God's people since the time that we're studying now, since Joshua, since Deuteronomy, since before that. And God says, I've chosen you, and now here you are, a people who, who, who follow me, but not according to knowledge. But then He says, you're going about seeking to establish not the righteousness of God, but your own righteousness. And how many times do people claiming to be God's people set about to establish their own standard for right and wrong? Look at the world we live in today. What is the main problem? What's the main disagreement among people today? It's what is right and what is wrong. We squabble and we fight and we bicker about what the standard is for morality because we have set ourselves up as our own kings. And because of that, God's standard has gone to the wayside. Self as king. Well, what kind of king did Israel get? It's very interesting as you study their first king. He was a king with early promise. Who is that? Well, it's Saul. You go to 1 Samuel and you look at the, uh, the ninth chapter there of 1 Samuel. And it's amazing how well things seem to start out at first. In verse 1 it says, now this is 1 Samuel 9 and verse 1, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bichorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. And I want you to notice verse 2. A choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel 
a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. This was a man who was taller, bigger, stronger, more handsome than any of the people who were around him. He physically stood out in every way possible. He looked like a leader. And so he fit the bill from a very early situation. But not only did he look the part, number two, he was humble. In chapter 10, as you continue going through this context, in verse 22 it says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if a man should yet come thither. And notice what it says, And the Lord answered, Behold, he, Saul, has hid himself among the stuff. He's hid himself among the stuff. So think about that circumstance. You've got a man who is head and shoulders bigger and taller and stronger than everybody else. And yet Saul, Saul is now hiding. Doesn't want to be seen, doesn't want to be found, and uh, he's, the moment has become too big for Saul. What a man at the beginning so large in stature, so handsome, so capable in appearance, and yet seemingly so humble. As you continue, continue in 1 Samuel chapter 10, you see some more indications of his early character. There was so much resistance to Saul. And then in verse 25, Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and he wrote it in a book, and, uh, and it says, As you continue, he laid it upon before the Lord, and Samuel sent all the people away, every man unto his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? 1 Samuel 10 and verse 27. And they despised him and brought him no presents. But notice the last words in chapter 10. He held his peace. It takes a big man not to say anything. A big man to refuse to speak in such circumstances of resistance. 1 Samuel chapter 10, a man who's humble, a man who is self-controlled. 1 Samuel 9, a man who looks the part. But this was a king with eventual wickedness. He was, as it turned out to be, self-willed. Chapter 13, you continue uh, looking at his endeavors and you see just how bad it got. In verse 7 it says, Some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. And the people followed him trembling. And he tarried, verse 8, for seven days. Why? Waiting on Samuel for the time that he'd said he'd come so that he could offer sacrifices for the people. But he did not show. And so in verse 9, Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering offerings, self-willed. Not only was he self-willed, he was disobedient, downright disobedient. Chapter 15, God commands them as they go to battle that they are to completely destroy the Amalekites. And of course, Saul doesn't do that. Not completely, not as fully as he needs to. He spared instead, verse 15, the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord, and the rest, he says, they have utterly destroyed. Saul even goes as far to say that he has obeyed the voice of the Lord, verse 20, when in reality he's not. Samuel calls him to the carpet, so to speak, and condemns him for his actions. And Saul in verse 24 says, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and of thy words, because I feared the people. Notice even in his confession, Saul is unable to acknowledge completely and totally his own guilt. Self-willed, disobedient, he was jealous and hateful. He tried to kill David on a number of occasions after calling for him. He's hot and cold. Why? because he sees the jealousy. David's fame, his reputation is growing. And Saul, jealous and hateful. As well, he's superstitious. He calls for the witch just after he's condemned witchcraft. 
He calls for someone who can conjure, according to Him, familiar spirits. It's an interesting situation if you look there in the context of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28. It's obvious that that woman, that conjurer of familiar spirits, didn't expect to actually be able to conjure a familiar spirit, to bring someone back from the dead. She was as surprised as anyone else because in in actuality she was a snake oil salesman. She wasn't really capable of doing what she had claimed to do, but Saul believed it because he was superstitious and he had left faith in God. Ultimately, Saul's life ended in disaster. He takes his own life rather than be embarrassed at the hands of his enemies. And Saul's life lay in ruin. What's the lesson? What should you and I take from this? Well, we need to be careful what we wish for. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 12 says, Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, arrogant, and before honor, well, there is humility. Proverbs 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So many times we believe that that we are strong enough, as we talked about this morning, and we raise ourselves up as the standard and we pat ourselves on the back for all of the good we've done when what we don't realize is that we've forsaken God. And it might just be that those things that we think are so great are really the things that will bring about our downfall. Paul describes people like that in Philippians 3 and verse 19. He says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. It's their own lusts and desires and satisfying those. That's all that drives them. And we live in a world by and large that seems to fit that description. People who are motivated by desire to fill their own desires, to satisfy their own lusts. But we recognize that raising ourselves up as the standard of right and wrong, placing our own desires above God's, we need to be careful what we wish for. We might get everything we think we want and realize that the end of all of that is really only destruction. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul warned that the time would come when men would not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The picture there is of a group of people who get what they want. But Paul says, be careful what you wish for, because all you will get is destruction from God. God as king, self as king, and now finally this evening, David as king. 1 Samuel doesn't get completely into uh, the life of David as the king, But the one of the few things that that it really does focus on relative to David is the standard by which that new king was chosen. God has rejected Saul for his disobedience, for his self-will, for his arrogance and his wickedness. And now God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse to choose a king to replace Saul. And Jesse passes all of his, his... choicest sons before Samuel, these large, uh, wonderful specimens of men, only to discover what God says in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. See, what a great transition from Saul to David. God said, Israel, you want a king? Let me give you what you want. Someone who is just like you, as self-centered and as self-willed as you are. But now, God says, the second king is going to be what you need. Someone who is at his heart, one who desires to please God. You're familiar that in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, God says that he now has desired one after his own heart. And that's certainly the description of David. So we see in David one who fits the bill of God's leader. Someone whose heart desires to serve God. 
What kind of person was David in 1 Samuel as 1 Samuel describes him? Well, he was a champion. You're familiar with his battle with Goliath, that large Philistine that none of the other Israelite men of war would battle, and yet David said, I'll do it. And I'll do it without Saul's best armor. I'll do it with a slingshot and five smooth stones. Not only was he a champion, he was a friend. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 3 describe his relationship with, with Jonathan, whom he loved as his own soul. Jonathan was a fa- or, excuse me, David was a faithful friend. David was a champion. David was a servant of God. What I've got listed there on the screen for you tonight are two instances that illustrate this in 1 Samuel. There will be more in 2 Samuel. But in 1 Samuel chapter 24, quite humorously, Saul has entered into a a place where he can, as the King James says, cover his feet. What is he doing? He's using the bathroom in a vulnerable position to say the least. And David sneaks up behind him and has opportunity to take his life, but he refuses to do so. A similar event happens in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. He has an opportunity while Saul is sleeping, while his javelin is in the ground beside him. David has an opportunity to take the life of Saul. He doesn't do it. Why? Not because David has any special affinity for Saul, but because Saul is God's anointed. You see, he's still king. And as he is still king, God is still in some measure in approval of him. And David said, as long as there's life in Saul's body, it's not my responsibility to take his life because he is God's anointed. He's a servant of God. Above his own displeasure, above his own mistreatment, David was a servant of God. What's the point? Well, here very, uh, very succinctly is our point. Character matters. The character of our leaders matters. You know, we live in a world today that seems to minimize character when it comes to leadership. If they are individuals who who can speak well, who have a, a, a measure of charisma about them, shouldn't that be enough? Or if their beliefs completely align with ours in every possible conceivable way, shouldn't that be enough regardless of their character? But God says the character of leaders matters. He chose someone after His own heart. He encouraged Samuel to look not on the outward appearance, but to look upon the heart. See, in Proverbs 20 and verse 28, the Proverbs writer reminds us that mercy and truth preserve a king. And his throne is upholden by mercy. Mercy and truth. See, those are the things that should really determine the character and the ability of someone to lead. We need to recognize this evening that very important lesson. The book of Samuel is all about king. God was to be Israel's king. This evening, God is to be at the center of our life. He is to rule supreme in our hearts and lives. Does He? Or do we as the nation of Israel have a tendency to raise ourselves up as the sole authority in life? If so... Beware, take care that we don't fall into the same trap as the nation of Israel. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, as always, we are grateful for the wonderful blessings you've given us. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who uh, may be affected by uh, storms and other things going on throughout this life. We pray that you will be with us as we continue to navigate through the the pandemic and its after effects. We pray, Father, that you will bless this congregation, bless this community, bless our nation, bless our world. Father, may we look to you for true rulership and headship in our lives. May we be guided by your truth and your righteousness alone. Forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen.